So first of all, uh, dear doctors, I would like to thank you all of uh, thanks all of you for taking time, taking time for the digital CME on aerosol therapy uh, for OAD can novel uh, delivery platform meet today's challenge or not. So to discuss more on this, we have with us Dr. Anshum Aneja Arora, uh, pulmonologist, Aero Health, Gurgaon. So Dr. Anshum has done a remarkable work in the field of obstructive as well as the restrictive airway disease. So let's welcome Dr. Anshum to start today's session. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gagan, for the kind introduction. So um, good evening, everyone. And uh, they say that uh, change is inevitable. But uh, who knew that uh, this drastic change in this world will so immensely alter our practice? And uh, the way that we connect with our patients will also be totally altered. So today, uh, we are here today to discuss uh, this change in one of the most common respiratory disorders that we deal in our practice, and that is bronchial asthma. And um, in the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes, we'll try and understand what changes we can adopt in our practice. And uh, is there, are there something new that we can actually utilize and make uh, our patients' lives much better? So, um, We've all undergone this uh, drill of understanding how to do telemedicine and video consultations. And uh, we've actually mastered it, I would say, over the last seven to eight months because there was a time when we never thought of uh, diagnosing and you know, treating our patients just on the basis of a video call without actually putting a stethoscope on their chest. And uh, from a time where uh, clinical examination was our mastery, we've come to a time where uh, the patients also want to maintain a distance. They don't want to come to the hospitals and clinics so often with the fear of uh, contracting the infection. And we also want them to be safe, keeping our safety in mind as well and keeping a safe distance at the time of examination. So uh, in this era of telemedicine, our practice for asthma has also uh, been highly affected and um, we have our own set of challenges in understanding and diagnosing them. We cannot hear the classical V's over a phone call. So uh, we have to use our clinical intellect to actually start prescribing the medicines. And uh, one of the biggest challenges that I, I feel we are facing is with the way the patients are taking treatment. Because uh, I remember the time when uh, the patients used to come for every asthma follow-up, so as a protocol, it was so important to check their inhaler technique. But now with this kind of interaction that we are having with patients, it's become so difficult to ensure that the patients are taking their inhalers in the right manner. And same ways, there has been such a drastic change in recommendations also and advisories also for asthma treatment that we have to change the way we practice. So uh, in April 2020, when Gina advised us to stay away from nebulization and ask our patients to avoid nebulization, I think that was another big change because we've always been used to prescribing nebulization to patients who have severe exacerbations. So there is a change and we have to learn to adopt to the new normal. We are asking our patients to take their regular medications properly, regularly, and not stop them in, in the fear that, you know, if they worsen, if they contract COVID, could this also lead to increase in complications? We are also ensuring that we keep them enabled with how to manage a simple exacerbation themselves, and they should be clear what to do in case they have a worsening of symptoms. So all this is the new normal, and we should be ready to get our patients adjusted to it. And this is what I'll be discussing in, our, in my talk today. So uh, one of the key elements for improving patients' adherence to medication and making sure that they are on the right track is to enable them to understand what to take if there is a problem. And a smart therapy approach has really simplified the patient's perspective of uh, taking inhalers. They do not uh, there, there's no more confusion where the patient will be asked to take an SOS Saba 
or he's confused should i take a salbutamol inhaler should i take salbutamol ipratropium combination should i take my nebulizer so uh, smart therapy the single inhaler for maintenance and relief that is one thing that has really made things easier for a patient to understand and it has also brought about a confidence in us that the patient is taking the right drug uh, it's also important to uh, be clear that the patient's device should be something that is giving him the optimum dose of the medication. So this is another key element that we have to really work upon and patients should be satisfied and prefer that device. So only because we have prescribed it doesn't mean that the patient will take it at home and will be happy with it. So if we're able to meet these, uh, these three elements, I think we'll be able to control most of our patients even on a video call. So uh, do you feel it's the right time now that most of our patients know how to manage their asthma on their own and their emergency department visits are much reduced. I think this is, this is high time that patients start acting according to the plan that is given by their treating doctors. So since I was mentioning about the smart therapy, uh, let me discuss how this concept of smart actually came into being. So there was this huge landmark trial called the INSPIRE study, which was conducted worldwide with more, more than 300 clinical sites. And uh, this was a questionnaire based study basically uh, to understand what is the duration of the worsening of symptoms uh, from the onset of a change in symptoms in patients to understand when they might get an exacerbation. So, what, so they observed that almost a mean of five days is there before the patient starts getting the initial signs. So patients reported that yes, it took around five days for me to have worsened symptoms wherein I had to then uh, go in for an oral corticosteroid or inhale, increase in my existing treatment. And also to understand whether what was the first choice of the patients um, that they did when they actually had a worsening of symptoms. So uh, this study, uh, it was an observational uh, study. It was a questionnaire-based study. And uh, they, they concluded that maybe there is some evidence, there may be some uh, hope that if a patient takes a combination medication with inhaled corticosteroid and lava, when their symptoms are bothersome, this could result in fewer exacerbations. So this was what had to be studied further in a good controlled clinical trial. And, um, and there were several studies done after that, uh, which uh, included the GOAL study, the GREEN study, and um, other studies, the SIGMA trial, which I will be discussing further. And most of these studies highlighted that in the real world scenario, if a patient is taking an SOS SABA, versus a patient who is taking a combination of an inhaled corticosteroid and lava as an SOS medication over and above his maintenance dose, then the chances of severe exacerbation worsening will be much less. And this is what I'll, I'll go through the data in the coming few study, uh, slides. So this formed the basis of the new recommendations uh, which were given by Gina for step one, step two management in uh, people above 12 years of age. So uh, although these studies, there, there is some uh, thing that I want you to understand that these studies, the mean age group was around 30 to 40 years of age. And uh, Gina has, however, universally adopted this even in adolescence. So uh, I think there is still some gap where these guidelines, we, we need to further have more data on adolescent group. But then Gina recommended that for all individuals above 12 years of age, Step one management no longer should be an SOS short acting beta agonist because the over dependence of a short acting beta agonist actually led to more worsening and patients were landing up into more exacerbation in these studies. And as step two, the daily low dose inhaled corticosteroid will be continued and the patient can have a SOS ICS formatrol in this case but an ICS lava combination. Now again, if you notice that the GINA guidelines actually mention budesonide formatrol combination. And the reason mainly is because the data was more with this combination. And in Europe, this is the combination that is more, uh, that is actually approved for use as reliever as well. 
But um, we know that there are so many other combinations. There is a combination of salmitrol fluticasone, which I think will should have a reciprocable effect. And then there's cyclosonide uh, also. So, however, GINA uh, guidelines actually they uh, emphasized on the budesonide formatrol because that was the basis of the studies that they referred to. And this is that study that actually formed the basis of this huge change. So this is, uh, these are the results from the Sigma 1 and Sigma 2 trial. It was also a funded study um, on Symbicort. However, it was a well-planned uh, double-blinded control clinical trial, a randomized control trial, and this also had a huge population. More than 4,000 patients were included in the Sigma-1 trial, and uh, this actually validated the outcomes of the results of the INSPIRE study. And they observed, if you see, then if a patient, uh, so they included patients who were already on asthma medication, and they were on step two of GINA, and uh, these patients, if they required an SOS medication, so um, they, they studied terbutaline in this group as Saba. So when the patients were taking Saba as the SOS medication versus patients who were taking inhaled corticosteroid and formatrol combination, they noticed that there was a significant difference in the rate of having severe, severe exacerbation. So when the same inhaler, the single inhaler, which was the combination inhaler, was used to be taken as an SOS inhaler, there was around a 60% reduction in the severe asthma exacerbation at the end of 52 weeks. And the data from this study was further uh, extended and they conducted the Sigma-2 trial, where again now they compared the budesonide formatrol combination as needed and budesonide maintenance. But if you see, then if a patient is taking budesonide as the uh, maintenance dose and now is taking an SOS budesonide formatrol as and when needed, again, you see that the, the results are comparable. So does that mean that uh, a patient can also take uh, an ICS as an SOS medication or uh, should he take an ICS lava? So basically, the authors concluded that if a patient is taking ICS LABA, then the total dose of the uh, corticosteroid that the patient is taking in the systemic uh, delivery of the corticosteroid was much less as compared to ICS alone. So again, that formed the basis of the recommendation that a patient can take ICS LABA combination. But does that mean that we should switch all our patients to uh, a combination? or these step two patients should be given only inhaled corticosteroid low dose. It was further actually explored in further studies, one of which I will be uh, showing you, that if a patient's main issue, the main problem here is symptom control, the patient has to be continued on a low dose ICS as part of step two of GINA. But as an SOS reliever, when the patient for an exacerbation is taking ICS lava, the outcomes are much better. And overall, the smart therapy, uh, you know, uh, is better than the SOS Saba. So that was the main conclusion. So this is another uh, slide from the same study. And you see that uh, they reported a less, less than one fifth dose of ICS intake in patients who were taking the combination now and uh, much uh, more result and resulted in much fewer days of high reliever use. So patients actually improved earlier. This is the other trial that I'm mentioning, uh, the novel study. Now this was a uh, practical study. They tried to ascertain the real world scenario and um, from a controlled setting where all the patients were in step two GINA when they were enrolled into SIGMA trial. Now they observe patients who just the inclusion criteria was that they have a physician diagnosed asthma. So it included all mild patients also who were actually earlier taking SOS uh, short acting beta agonist and tried to see that whether the patient who was taking albuterol alone, whether they fared better when they added the SOS ICS lava combination. And again, uh, this study which was done in New Zealand, Australia, uh, this study also showed that 
uh, as compared to 23% of patients who had an exacerbation in the salbutamol group, 12.5% patients had exacerbations in the butacinide maintenance group and around 11.9% in the combination group. And the dose of butacinide in the combination group was lesser as compared to ICS alone. So again, it validates that the rate of exacerbation and severe exacerbations was much lower with as needed butacinide formatrol combination rather than SABA for an SOS reliever use. Again, telling us that smart approach, smart therapy approach is useful and of great value. So uh, with the use of this therapy, we expect that the number of exacerbations in our patients will be lesser and more, more so it simplifies the treatment for our patients. So in, in this era of teleconsult, when a patient asks us that doctor, what should I take if I have symptoms beyond, you know, taking your dose of inhaler, then instead of taking a short acting beta agonist, we must encourage them to take an extra dose of their own inhaler and that will help prevent exacerbations. So in my practice as well, I've seen that this is really helping and uh, with the GINA adopting it and we following the guidelines, uh, I think it will make a good clinical difference. But uh, another thing that we need to consider here is no matter how good your drug is and which combination you use, whether we use formatrol butacinide or salmetrol fluticason or any other combination, if our drug delivery is not good and the device is not good, then the drug does not reach targeted airways. So this forms the second part of my discussion today. And this is what uh, I am targeting at today. Is there another device or is there another newer drug delivery platform that we can actually utilize in this current scenario and make the outcome better? So it has been well understood that nearly 80% of all the patients who have been time and again shown how to use inhalers correctly will not use them correctly uh, outside of a clinical trial setting. So most of the patients will have some problem or the other. And in a repeated visit also to the clinic, uh, when we are actually seeing their inhaler technique on our own, spending so much time with the patient to check their inhaler technique, I think most of the patients will do some error and, and they will not be able to take the inhaler properly unless they are highly trained. So this is one big obstacle that is coming when we are doing teleconsultation now, nowadays because we are not able to actually monitor the in device as well. And there is such a gamut and a basket of devices which are available to us that um, choosing the right one for the patient and uh, selecting the most efficient one or uh, the one that we prefer the best has become a further issue because we are not able to understand patient preferences so well over a teleconsult. So there are problems with MDI spaces, we all know, and the biggest problem is the problem of coordination of breath. There are problems with spacers also um, because patients uh, find it more bulky, they are not cleaning it properly, most of the patients who used to come back with their spacers would have this white layer of deposition of the medicine and then land up in oral thrush. So that is another issue. And with DPIs, again, there's this problem of being able to have that much inspiratory flow rate. And that brought us to another novel device, a new device in the market, which was called breath actuated inhaler. So I will be discussing in the next few slides about this newer device called the breath actuated inhaler. So training of patients in the correct use of inhaler in the presence of breath actuated inhalers is something that I have personally found much more effective and I'll show you how. So uh, this is another data uh, which was published in CHESS that incorrect inhaler use in patients with asthma and COPD was unacceptably high. So uh, we need a well-trained patient to be able to ensure a proper drug delivery. And this, uh, I think, has been overcome recently by the launch of these devices. So breath-actuated inhalers are actually inhalers that sense the patient's inhalation through the actuator and then they fire the medication automatically. 
So one big issue that it overcomes is the problem of coordination. And in case you are uh, giving an inhaler to a patient, I think this device will simplify the way you practice. So there were various kinds of inhalers uh, which were breath actuated which have come over many years. The auto inhaler, the easy breathe and ready inhaler. And recently there's a new inhaler, the synchro breath which has also been introduced. And uh, the advantages of these inhalers are that it really overcomes the need of training. And it is claimed that they get actuated at very low inspiratory flow rates which is not uh, possible in a patient who's in exacerbation with a regular MDI. And they are easier to use. And without a spacer also, we can achieve a similar drug deposition. These inhalers are also easy to give to children and elderly, which is again another advantage with these MDIs. So this is how a breath actuated inhaler looks like. And uh, it basically has a compressed spring and an inhaler engine so when the patient inhales through this small orifice he opens the cap and inhales there's an automatic firing of the medication if the patient does not take that dose and closes the cap then the next time he opens it then the dose will be delivered so there's less wasting of the dose as well so this is the data which is uh, which has been presented by CIPLA and this data looks promising and they mentioned that the fine particle mass of the drug which is delivered to the lungs in the breath actuated inhaler is more than an MDI uh, for both combination as for budesonide and formatrol alone and so the combination also and uh, this inhaler is said to be triggered with very low inspiratory flow rate from 23 to 35 liter per minute so uh, if if it is able to provide uh, inhalation with such a trigger then it should also be effective in patients who are in an exacerbation. This is another um, uh, slide uh, given by uh, Cipla where they are showing that uh, synchro breath, the lung deposition is much more as compared to the MDI. And we hope that uh, with the increase in lung deposition, the effect of the same medication combination which we are using with our MDIs should be more. Overall patient preference and satisfaction has also been reported to be much better with uh, this inhaler as compared to the conventional MDI. And uh, again, in this data published in 2019, just by following the information leaflet, you see from visit one to visit two, patients are doing exceptionally well with a breath actuated inhaler with the synchro breath versus this conventional MDI. Here as well, you see uh, patients, even in healthy participants and patients alike, the actual uh, inhaler technique, if you see, it is there is a significant difference here. This is uh, another uh, data. It's actually from a poster that was published. So it was done on patients where they are seeing that the change in asthma for a control questionnaire from the baseline to 12 week, there is a significant improvement with the change of inhaler alone. And here they've used salmatrol fluticasone combination. Here as well, you see that the well-controlled asthma, if you see at the end of 12 weeks, there are more patients with well-controlled asthma in the synchro breath group. Patients' preference also in terms of easier to understand, to remember, to inhale, easy to carry, confidence to use, much, much better as compared to MDI. So 91% of patients who actually used it preferred this device to others. So um, I would be happy to know the uh, groups uh, to the participants' experience in terms of this device. But believe me, uh, in my own practice, one thing that I have genuinely noticed is that when you have an N95 mask on and a shield on and the patient's wearing his mask, you would not want him to remove his mask and to, you know, train him and you removing your mask and training your patient about the inhaler technique. And this is one area where I have found great use with breath actuated inhalers because it is so simple to train. All that the patient has to do is open the cap and inhale and take a slow deep inhalation. 
that uh, I think it gives me more confidence when the patient is taking this inhaler as compared to a conventional MDI. So I think it has a lot of potential, which we'll have to see over time, but uh, it has definitely helped in this era of the COVID pandemic. Uh, furthermore, as I mentioned earlier, there are special concerns with patients with exacerbations. We have been practicing the uh, prescription of nebulizers and nebulized medications to our patients during exacerbations, but there have been so much of concerns with aerosol transmission and aerosol generation uh, during this pandemic with nebulizers that we have also kind of curtailed ourselves, especially in a setting in a hospital, in a ward where so many patients are taking nebulizers, we would want to, you know, minimize the use if possible. And this is again one area where this inhaler may have some promise. The other thing that I think is really important is that as an alternative to nebulizer, when we see MDI and spacer combination, then the hygiene maintenance in a spacer is not as good. Uh, there have been, as I said, so many patients like you all of us have seen where the inhaler, the spacer is all white in color. It's no longer transparent and the patients are not maintaining it well. The patients are also interchanging between various family members. They may be using a spacer. So this problem, I think, also has been much simplified with these devices and, patient, and the device hygiene is also much better. If we talk about this practicality and use amongst various age groups, uh, in a study uh, in VZ children, again, when a comparison is made between breath actuated inhalers and DPI, it is seen that breath actuated inhalers actually use more and it got actuated 99 of 100 times. So uh, the ability to take the inhaler is also enhanced. And this is another Indian uh, data where they are uh, they compared what is the maximum PIF generated in a patient with severe, very severe COPD and in pediatric patients less than 12. And they have observed that even in very severe COPD and a young child, they will be able to generate a PIFR of 40 which is good enough for this inhaler because it is set to fire at inspiratory rates as low as 23. So again, uh, it has a lot of use in this population and it is so simple to use that we will hardly have to train the patient. All they have to do is they have to shake it well, open the cover and breathe in slowly and deeply. So the only thing is a slow, deep inhalation and the breath hold and it activates at flow rates above 23. So there's no need of assembly. There's no problem of the aerosols leaking out from the top. There's no problem of coordinating it. And uh, obviously the problems with DPI are also gone. So um, it, it looks promising. And uh, when they have, when the combination of formatrol budosunide is coming with this device, then it is easier to practice the smart therapy approach also, I think. So um, I, I think with more and more combinations of medication and uh, more breath actuated inhalers being available, it will become easier for us to follow the guidelines and to give the patients the optimal treatment. So in summary, a uh, lot of evidence has shown that the smart approach will simplify therapy and improve adherence in patients. And if we combine it with a good device, then in this era where we are actually avoiding nebulizers and we, we are making sure that the patients are able to understand our instructions on daily call, I think it has a lot of potential and uh, we must try to assess that in real world scenario, will this fit the description that has been provided. So um, that is all from my end uh, today. And I thank you all for the patient hearing. I'll be happy to take any questions if they are there. Thank you. So uh, is there uh, any... Thank you so much, ma'am. If, uh, if, if any doctor have any question, they can ask. So, that box as well. So, uh, Dr. Ayush Pandey has raised a question that uh, uh, smart can be uh, used as a reliever as well. Yes, yes. So smart therapy means that it is the single inhaler for maintenance and reliever use. So, so smart therapy implies that and we can, the patient can use it as a reliever.
Thank you, ma'am. Uh, one more question we have from Dr. Gagan Bali. Uh, he is asking which type of inhalers are good in this COVID era, because uh, while prescribing the inhaler, so is there any chances of infection with DPI and MDIs? Yes, so uh, basically, as I said in my talk, that uh, in this era, we need inhalers which are much, much simpler to use and where the chances of error are minimum and the chances of drug deposition are maximum. So in those terms, these breath actuated inhalers look quite promising. And uh, I have myself experienced that patient satisfaction is much better. Uh, and I am more confident giving the inhaler because I know that the amount of drug wasted is much less. And the second part of your question about chances of infections in DPI and MDI, uh, well, um, DPI alone, see, if a patient is already having an exacerbation and is not able to maintain, to generate that much of inspiratory flow, uh, he already has a poor lung reserve, then we, we will not be able to give him DPI. And uh, with that, you know, with the existing morbidity, if he chances COVID infection, then uh, as we know that there are more chances of severe complication. So definitely there are there is that kind of uh, chance, but obviously not a direct chance of having more susceptibility to uh, COVID infection when they are taking the other inhalers. But this this uh, inability to fulfill the uh, requirement of the inhaler dose, uh, I think will uh, affect the patient. Yeah. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, one more question we have from Dr. Sachin Kheda. He is asking, uh, breath actuated inhalers can be used in acute exacerbations. Yeah, so data actually shows that uh, breath actuated inhalers will fire, will, will actually uh, deliver the medicine at much less inspiratory rate. And when we are talking about an exacerbation, if the patient's inspiratory flow rate is less than 30, then uh, theoretically these inhalers will be able to deliver dose even to that patient. So in those terms, uh, I think data is showing that they can be used in an exacerbation. There is no head-to-head -head study where exacerbation patients have been taken and given breath actuated inhalers vis-a-vis -vis, uh, a nebulizer. But, uh, but the drug delivery that is uh, shown to be achieved with this inhaler and uh, the inspiratory flow rate, it should be uh, easy to give in an exacerbation. I have also prescribed uh, this inhaler in a patient in exacerbation who I felt is not fit for hospital yet, but will be uh, safe at home. And I did not want to give a nebulizer. And uh, there have been such patients and they have recovered out of uh, the uh, exacerbation. It could be because of the proper drug delivery or it may be because the other, man other factors were also taken care of, but uh, they do have a potential and they can be tried at least in mild exacerbations. We can do it. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, one more question we have. Uh, Dr. Anil is asking, instead of using instead of using nebulization, can we use breath actuated inhaler in this COVID era? Is this the best option? Yeah, so as I said, in mild cases of exacerbations and exacerbations which do not require a hospital admission, uh, I think we can definitely uh, go ahead with these inhalers. Uh, provided our patient is much uh, is you know controlled and uh, he's he's not due for he does not look as severe as a patient who requires hospitalization and uh, the data also supports that uh, but uh, date if you ask me if there is any study about it then uh, there is no head to head comparison between nebulizer and breath actuated inhaler but it is quite promising uh, thanks a lot ma'am I would request if any doctor have any query, they can either ask in the chat box or they can unmute their mic and they, they can ask. So I hope uh, every query has been resolved. So I, I would like to thank Dr. Ancham on behalf of Shifla and all the presented doctors. This session I trust has helped, uh, helped us in understanding the basic challenges in the management of OAD. And uh, I must also thank each one of you for your presence and your participation. And without, without your participation, this session won't be possible. So thanks a lot. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Anshum. Thank you all presented doctors. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.